Um, all right, let's go ahead and get started. It's seven o'clock. Um, so welcome back everybody to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And um, tonight we're going to talk about Tathata. So the theme for tonight is Tathata, translated as suchness or thusness. This is the theme. Um, so really quickly, a few words about this idea. Uh, we, we'll get into the language, we'll get into the specific kind of meaning of the word, but the theme for tonight, this idea of suchness or thusness, it's, it's very, very related to the, the overarching theme that we've been working with now for several uh, Sunday nights. And that is, we've been working on a Dharma door, a teaching of the Buddha, and we've been working on this Dharma door called the single characteristic Dharma door. And we've been reading a text, we've been reading a sutra, in which all of these different bodhisattvas have been giving us different ways of thinking about how to understand this single characteristic, this ekta lakshana. So tonight, I want to talk about this idea of suchness or thusness. It's come up probably almost every Sunday night in that way. It's, be, it's such an important idea, but I haven't spent sort of a whole night just focusing on it. And what I realized is that tonight we will most likely finish the section of the sutra on the single characteristic. And there's kind of no better time to talk about this idea of suchness than kind of right now. So that was actually kind of a long-winded way of saying that the idea of suchness, this, this actual idea of tathata, it doesn't exactly appear in the sutra tonight, but it's kind of all throughout it. It's one of those ideas that it just permeates everything we're talking about. So that's why I wanted to take a step back tonight and begin by kind of doing a deep dive into this idea of tathata. So let's begin with, <clears throat> well, let's just begin with the language, the, the word itself. I always like to begin with the etymology. So the root of the word is just the first part, just the, oh, I kind of erased it a little bit, but just the tatha, just tatha. And tatha means such. <laughs> so the way that you could think of it, it's a very, very simple kind of word, but you know, you could think of it as, you know, if, if somebody, um, if somebody asked me, you know, oh, how do you, how do you do that? You know, you're doing, you know, maybe you're sewing. How do you do that? Well, like so. <laughs> and I didn't choose sewing just to make a funny pun about just so these things just happen fortuitously. <laughs> but my point is that if, if you demonstrated something to somebody and it was, you know, like that, <laughs> like so, tatha. My point is, is it's tatha is not an extremely meaningful word. It's sort of a grammatical phrase for and so. In fact, you often see in Sanskrit texts the word repeated, tatha tatha. And in English, we say so and so. So and so said such and such. <laughs> That's tatha tatha. So and so. So the root of this word and the idea of it is kind of simple in that way. It's like, you know, like so. <laughs> and it's somewhat demonstrative in that sense where it's like, and so, and thus. But then leave it to the Buddhists to turn this word that just means so, such, tatha, 
leave it to the Buddhists to turn this into a deep philosophical idea by calling it tathata, basically kind of turning, turning the very idea of like so, turning that so, the so-ness <laughs> into something, tathata. And well, actually, I don't want to tell you this just yet, because the first thing I want to mention about this word is that this is one of those words, this technical Buddhist idea of tathata, it's one of those words that you do find in the Pali Canon. So you do find this idea in the early Buddhist teachings. And I... Mm, Maybe sooner than later, I'm going to talk about what it meant or what it means in the Pali Canon, in, in the kind of the early path. But it's one of those ideas that the, the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, like the sutra we've been reading, it's one of those ideas that the Mahayana seems to have chosen from the early Buddhist tradition and said, this one, like this is a good idea. A lot like emptiness. Emptiness is another very profound idea that you do find in the early Buddhist canon, but it's sort of not really the most prominent idea. And it doesn't really mean entirely what it means in Mahayana Buddhism. But the Mahayana Buddhists seem to have taken this idea of emptiness and said, ah, that's the Dharma. And so emptiness becomes a foundation of Mahayana Buddhism, and so does this idea of tathata. While I'm at it, because I, I actually meant to do this, I want to do this tonight. So the general, a really general way of thinking about tathata, suchness or thusness, a really simple way to understand it in the Mahayana tradition is that it's kind of very much a complement to the idea of emptiness. And what I like to say, and by this is just my language, this is just the way that I, ta I talk I, or the way that I teach, but if emptiness is about emptiness, I like to say that tathata is about fullness. It's the fullness that you get after the emptiness. So we are, as we dive deeper into this tonight, we are going to have to do quite a bit of thinking about emptiness to appreciate this idea of the fullness or the tathata. Before I go down that road of the fullness, I want to tell you what this word or what this idea of tathata means in the Pali Canon. So once again, it is an idea that you find in the early tradition. I, from, from the research I've been doing this week on this idea, it's one of those ideas though that you find more often in commentarial literature than in the original teachings of the Buddha. So I just want you to know that right away that it's not a word that the Buddha seems to have used a lot. It's a word that later early Buddhists of that Pali tradition or the Pali based tradition, it's a word that they used to describe something. And one of the main ways that they describe it, so there's a teaching of the early Buddhist path. There's a teaching that you might be familiar of it with, and it's called the three marks of existence, usually. They are actually characteristics. They are lakshana, the three characteristics of reality. And in the early Buddhist tradition, they would talk a lot about the importance of seeing things as impermanent nothing lasts. 
And that's the view, that's the right view, that's the samyak drishti, the right view is to, to understand that all things are impermanent. That's the first mark. The second characteristic or mark of all things in the early Buddhist tradition is that they are all ultimately going to be sources of suffering. Another way to put that is, is that that they're not really going to give you joy and happiness like you might think. So they are all sort of a, they're all a letdown. You kind of think of it that way. <laughs> like all, all dharmas are, are a letdown in that way. So that's the second characteristic to sort of treat all dharmas as potential sources of suffering and things you might not want to get too involved with. And that brings me to the third characteristic of reality, which is this idea of all dharmas being without a self. And I want to tell you for all the kind of really deep dharma thinkers uh, out there tonight, I want to kind of really uh, clarify something that I think is important to understand. Normally, the third mark of existence, the third characteristic of their, their not being a self in all dharmas, it's not so much about, it, it sounds a little bit like emptiness, I know at first, and it's not so much about all phenomena, like a, a mechanical pencil or whatever, it's not about the pencil doesn't have a self. It's not that my cup doesn't have a self. The teaching, the third mark of existence is, it's about how in the experience, in the experience of seeing this pencil, there's no self seeing the pencil. This phenomena, this, this experience is happening sans self without a self going on there and that's the third characteristic or the third mark that oh and by the way the idea of course is that we sometimes think things are permanent or they might be permanent and then that would be confusion it wouldn't be seeing things correctly because things are impermanent we often think that's that'll do it <clears throat> that's going to give me the joy. That's going to bring me the pleasure. But that's the wrong view. The right view is, is that those things will not give you pleasure that way. <clears throat> and then we often think, hey, I'm thinking this or I'm looking at this, when in reality, there is no self there doing that. In the early Buddhist tradition, at least according to a lot of that commentarial literature I was telling you about, if you really see things as impermanent, as sources of suffering, and as they're not being a self seeing that thing, if you see it that way, you see it as such. You see it, you see it quote unquote, as it is. And I use the big scare quotes. These are the big giant, it's Halloween, right? These are the big scare marks, like, ah, I don't, so the, it's this idea. Anyways, I digress. <laughs> so seeing things as they really are, as, as sources of suffering, as impermanent with no self, that was to sort of see suchness. Now, I already realized something and I want to I want to catch this right away. I have a tendency, especially because of uh, internet zoom world, I have a tendency to focus on the visual. I speak using visual e examples and all of that. But when I'm talking about this way of seeing I don't mean with the eyes. It's a way of understanding the world, understanding all phenomena that we are experiencing in that sense. 
So it could be a sound, it could be a flavor, it could be a taste. Obviously tastes <clears throat> don't last, they fade away. Sometimes we think food will, will give us pleasure in that sense, right? And we often think I am eating the food that's giving me the pleasure that will last forever, right? So that's the, the three opposite of the three marks. <clears throat> okay, any questions about that real quick? Because again, that's early Buddhist teachings. It's what the word meant in the early tradition. Now, the one thing that I want to kind of pull from that, what I just mentioned, is I want to kind of, this is another thing that I want to say at the beginning very clearly. Suchness or tathata, it is basically how enlightened people see the world. And what I mean by that is, is that suchness is right up there with enlightenment. <laughs> so it's no small matter to speak about suchness. In the early tradition, again, it was seeing things clearly, not being deluded into permanence and self and all of that. And then as we get into the Mahayana, which is where I'm taking us now, it's going to be even more closely associated with the enlightened view of reality. So I just kind of want to make that clear that we're talking about something kind of very serious tonight in that way. So as I said, Tathata is one of those ideas that appears a little bit in the early tradition, but then the Mahayana comes along and it becomes a kind of um, a cornerstone, if you will, of their understanding of enlightenment and all of that. So now I want to talk about what Tathata means in the more of the Mahayana tradition. So as I mentioned, we're really going to have to do a little bit of thinking about emptiness to understand suchness. And, you know, emptiness is no easy idea to kind of really understand. I can talk about it a lot, but to really, really get it is a tricky one. So the first thing that I kind of want to address is that, you know, I've been trying to think of, you know, I'll use a, I'm going to use a clock tonight. Just, it, it serves a certain purpose. But the idea here is, is When I describe, when I talk about emptiness, and so right now we're about to do a deep dive into the emptiness of the clock, how it is that the clock is empty. And so the first thing that I want to kind of address is, and I say this often, if one understands emptiness, if one like really, really understands that, it's not that the clock disappears. It's not that like when you really get emptiness, things like poof, disappear. That's, that's not emptiness. Emptiness is not about non-existence. Emptiness is not about hollow vacuousness or em you know, empty as in, you know, like a hollow in that way. Emptiness is, again, it's sort of very, very subtle in that sense. Now, the easiest way that I've come to kind of explain emptiness is, and it's why I chose the clock. So once again, if, you know, if I just showed you this, you might say, oh, that is a clock. <laughs> and you wouldn't say, actually, because it would be grammatically inappropriate. You wouldn't say, those is a clock. <laughs> but it would kind of be more accurate for you to say those are a clock. Because there's the button, 
There's the hands, there's the face, there's these little things on the back. And of course, there's Mr. Battery in here. Now, you know, one or two, one or two, because a moment ago they were one. A moment ago when this was hiding, when this was hiding in there, it was just a clock. It was just a clock. But this looks like two things to me. In fact, this looks like, you know, I got this thing too. So again, it would probably more be more grammatically or not grammatically, but it would be more accurate to say those are a clock. But of course that is illogical because, well, it's grammatically inconsistent. Those are a clock. <laughs> That's why we have to say and think it, it is a clock. Now, of course, many of you have seen this clock before. And what we need to kind of keep in mind is what I always mention. What about somebody who's never seen a clock? What about somebody who's never kept time with that? What about somebody that doesn't know about those numbers? Doesn't know what those numbers mean? Doesn't know that a little circle of like that is indicative of time? They don't know about snooze. What's snoozing, right? But you know about snoozing. You know about time. You know about all of those things. So as we've spoken about in many Dharma doors, the realization is, oh, the clock, a clock is an idea. It's an idea. And this, uh, I did it again. <laughs> These conjure the image uh, or the idea of time and timekeeping and all of that in your mind. And so you say, oh, that's a clock. But check this out. Is, is that a clock? It's very thin for a clock. <laughs> Must be nanotechnology, right? Or does it resemble a clock? Again, this is a piece of paper. But if I asked you what that was, you might say, oh, it's a clock. And of course, like all broken clocks, this would be right twice a day. But the idea here is, is that this, this doesn't keep time. It, it doesn't actually clock. Like it doesn't tick, it doesn't talk, it doesn't move. So, oh, it just looks, it just looks like a clock but it's not really a clock, right? Well, guess what? <laughs> this clock hasn't worked for, for years. So if you think about it, there's no difference between these two because neither of them keep time. Neither of them actually function as a clock, but when you see this, you think clock, and when you see this you think clock. Where's this clock you keep talking about? Like, where is it? And the point about emptiness is that emptiness is about that single thing that we call a clock. But I showed you it's lots of things. It's lots of things. So what is this one thing you're, think you're referring to that you call a clock? What is the one thing? And my point is, is that emptiness is about that one thing that you think is there. But then we go, oh, but wait. You might think this is one thing. 
is it one thing? Because the last time I checked a battery, there's the battery casing, there's the battery acid inside, there's the copper part, the black part, there's the writing, there's all of that. So this is, oh, I can't talk about this, meaning the one thing, because there isn't one thing. The battery, the battery is another one of those concept idea things that I'm throwing onto this. So then let's talk about the battery acid is as a singular entity. Is a, is a little pool of battery acid one thing? Or is it another one of those moments where the mind is holding a multiple as a singular? When the mind says, that's a nice clock you got there, that's holding a multiple as a singular. And emptiness is about those singularities that don't actually exist out there, but we think they do. Everybody following me on that idea of emptiness? Yeah. Now, I always like to conclude this little talk on emptiness with the really, really important teaching. Just like a clock, that's actually a multiple, a variety of things, but the diluted, conditioned mind is like, oh, nope, that's just one thing, and it's called a clock. Well, <clears throat> this is a multiple. Ears, eyes, nose, body, blood, all the parts. But guess what we do? We wrap it all up into just one thing. And I call it Michael. The, you know, the one, the one thing, the one entity. <clears throat> but if I understand that teaching of emptiness, I understand how that idea of the single Michael is empty. And then I would be like, oh, okay, yeah, you're right. There's no Michael. There's ears, nose, all the parts. But aren't all the parts made of parts? So my ears are singularities that are not existent in that way. They too are empty. All of the parts are then empty in that sense. But wait a minute. I want to remind you. Just because I just talked about the emptiness of this and the emptiness of this, here they are. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't disappear. The idea is, though, is that if you understand that teaching of emptiness and are not seeing things as existent entities, but seeing them as so, as such, that's getting closer to tathata. But that's why I said you, you got to go through emptiness to get to the tathata. All right, so we still have a room to go. We still have places to go. But questions or comments about this so far? Okay, so. Now I want to make something even more clear or try to make something more clear. So last week, I uh, brought up a dream I had, and I've been talking about this dream nonstop since then. And I want to refer to that, just to the dream scenario. I want to refer to a dream state to make a point, to, to clarify something about suchness. So last week, I brought up a dream I had about discovering that there was somebody in my refrigerator and getting very angry about the fact that there was somebody in my refrigerator. That's the condensed version of the dream. Now, the thing about it is, is that I guess what I want to make clear, like what is, here's the, um, 
here's the, the, the litmus test for suchness. This is sort of a way to maybe understand if, to know if you're seeing suchness or not. So in my dream, as I mentioned, I believed or understood myself to be in my kitchen and that there was somebody in my refrigerator and I was angry about it and I was trying to get them to leave. Now, I mentioned last week that it wasn't a lucid dream, but I introduced the idea that had, had I become lucidly aware in the dream, had I sort of woken up, but still been in the dream and been aware that it was a dream, that would be closer to suchness using the dream as an analogy. And what I mean by that is, is that before I'm lucidly aware that it's a dream, I think I'm me and that's my refrigerator and this is somebody in my refrigerator and man, is that making me angry that they're in my refrigerator. Had I become lucidly aware that I was in a dream and that it wasn't my kitchen and it wasn't my refrigerator and it wasn't even a real, quote unquote, real person in a real refrigerator. Had I been, again, lucidly, co consciously aware of that, that would have been basically what I'm like, suchness, but again, analogously, meaning it's a dream, so we're not there yet. But the point is, if I really understood that it wasn't me or my kitchen or the refrigerator, and I just, there was no more room for anger, that's a litmus test of whether you're looking at suchness or not. There is no room for anger, desire in suchness. The idea is, is that if you are getting angry or you are desirous, then you are not dealing with suchness. You are dealing with objects and things in a kind of a world in that sense. So my point is, is that in my dream, for example, that I mentioned, in my dream, or at least when I woke up in the morning, I was very aware of how the anger about this whole situation, I was aware of how it was arising from the delusion that that was my kitchen and my refrigerator, that there was like a back and forth going on there. And so the idea again is, is that I'm confused about all of that. I'm confused about the real nature of myself, because as I mentioned, I thought it was my kitchen, but it wasn't my kitchen. So I was confused and I was angry and I wanted this person to, to leave in that way. So all of that was not suchness in that way. Whereas again, had I become lucidly aware that I was in that dream, I could have understood that although this isn't real, it is such. It is so. But the point is, is that there's no, again, there's no room for being angry about things as so, as such. They are so, they are such. But this is the deeper kind of point I want to make about suchness that often gets kind of overlooked. It's basically, and let's see, I probably should, yeah, I should probably pull this out of the dream scenario. So the reason why I kept catching myself and saying, but this isn't really suchness because we're still in a dream it's because suchness has to do with your disposition towards this reality, what we call the, the waking world or waking life. 
The idea here is, is that there is a way to, to understand this world as such, as so. And it's kind of like that dream state of just seeing that it is necessarily so. It is such. Now, the thing that I wanted to make sure, though, to, 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 to clarify, it would be inappropriate. It wouldn't be the Dharma if I were to say that this pencil is such, or this piece of paper is such. And the reason why you kind of dharmically can't do that is because the suchness, like I was saying about emptiness, the suchness is what you get once all of these reified, objectified things are emptied out. So my point is, is that thusness, suchness, it's always the whole experience, which includes understanding why you feel like you are you. But it is not thinking there's a you, it's understanding that the you-ness, that that self is such, it is so. And again, the, the only way that I can really articulate like, well, what's, how would I know? How would I know if I'm experiencing suchness? Are you angry? Are you anxious? Are you, are you fearful? If you have any of those kleshas, if you have any of those emotions towards these things, that's not suchness. Because to see things as being so, as I'm saying, there's just no... There's no room there for the anger. And the beauty of this teaching, by the way, is then we can then flip it and begin to kind of observe our anger. And what I mean by observe our anger, for example, when I, when I woke up from that dream, and I was still kind of, I wasn't angry that the person was in the refrigerator, but I was still very aware that, like, that I had gotten very angry. And every time I get very angry in that way, my first thought is still not enlightened. <laughs> It's the test for me. It's when I realize, ah, I still got a, well, quite a ways to go. If I'm still getting worked up about this stuff. It, and so what I mean is, is that it then becomes where you can flip it and begin to observe what you're desirous of, what you're angry about, and begin to sort of see and understand, oh, that's, um, that's an interesting thing. And what I mean by an interesting thing is I mentioned that in my dream state of trying to get this person out of my refrigerator, I mentioned that there's a, a, a kind of a, a realization about karma, which is that the actions that I was taking in the dream to try to get the person out of the, out of the refrigerator, those actions we're perpetuating the delusion that it was a real refrigerator and a real problem. So there's that perpetuation of it. And that's sort of, again, where our kind of the kleshas, talking about greed, anger, all of those things, you can then kind of use those as like, um, well, just places to notice. <laughs> in that sense, where you're still holding on, where you're still clinging in that sense. So, okay, everybody doing okay with suchness, tatha ta? Yeah, Noe, I was hoping to get a, a question. Hey there. So, yeah, this is great. Um, I suffer from sleep apnea. 
and have most of my life. And in, in the event of an episode of apnea, I am struggling and, and in, in terror and I'm having these sensations. And I've learned over time to go, but I'm breathing. There's a point where I realize, stop, you're breathing. You're not dying. Mm. And slowly in that state of calmness, I'm able to say, now stir. I can't move. I can't move my body physically, even though I'm, I'm awake. Mm -hmm. And I see you start to whimper. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and of course Spencer's trained to immediately grab me and sit me up at that point, and I'm like, "Thank you," and then I go back to sleep comfortably. That's an interesting state to be in. A, like so many years of doing this, it still happens even with the machine that I will wake up in a panic, drowning, or unable to move, have that panic, and realize, "No, no, no." I'm breathing. There's calm down. There's just a suchness of it. It's like, oh, not not today. <laughs> just wanted to share that. <clears throat> Thank you, Noe. Thank you, Noe. Excellent, excellent example. Um, I I would love to then add on to that or just emphasize Noe's point. You know, it's sort of an aside, but you know, the basic um Buddhist teaching of meditation, what's called the four foundations of mindfulness. It's bringing your attention to the body, specifically breathing, to then be begin to notice sensations like being afraid or being in that state, and then to the mind state that is, you know, is arising from that. And what I often tell people, and your I'm going to steal your example, by the way, Noe, because I often remind you know everyone that this technique of go to the body notice the breathing it is useful in a whole lot of situations not just meditation like i often mention if you are having a nightmare and but you think it's real so you, but you're in a dream it still works to come into the body even though you don't have a body because you're in a dream but you come into the awareness notice the breathing and it can resolve a nightmare it can resolve sleep apnea or resolve but uh help so okay um i have a question i think it's a question or a comment about it seems like the the reason the dream analogy works and this is you've said this many times is that in the dream, it's you and the refrigerator and the person in the refrigerator. But when you, if you're lucid dreaming or or when you wake up and think about it, you realize all of that is you or or all of that isn't you. <laughs> Either one, there's no you and versus a refrigerator, though no you and the person in the refrigerator. And as that seems related to what you were saying about the test for you know, if you're seeing things as suchness is if you're angry, because you can't be angry if there's no separation between you and the thing you're angry with, right? Excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> By the way, uh, Noam, you, you reminded me, I always like to check good old Wikipedia to see what Wikipedia is saying about these profound Buddhist ideas. And I'll tell you right away for the entry for Tapata, the basic definition is, is this kind of, <clears throat> kind of a state of reality beyond conceptualizing and free of the subject object relationship. I, I practically would have written a definition for Tapata like that. So kind of encourage you or kind of recommend if you want further reading on this idea. I wanted to add <clears throat> One more thing before we kind of go on. It's no, while you were while you were talking, I couldn't help but notice the two chairs behind you. And it made me realize like, oh, I should mention this about suchness, a good, a good, another good way to think about suchness. 
So one of the things that we've talked, we talk a lot about in Dharma Doors, we talk a lot about pratitya sam utpata, dependent co-origination. And one of the more subtle aspects of dependent origination, we've talked about, and I got deep into this, I think even last weekend, but a really deep idea about dependent origination is how the understanding is, is that with the very idea of my cup, there is co-arising the me, the Michael, who has a cup. And normally, of course, we don't think that that's the way this is working. There's me that is here for real now, and there's my cup. <laughs> But dependent origination is about how as I am claiming my cup, but also as I am owning my words, as I am in my house, as I am talking, to, you know, all of this appropriation, but it is the appropriating that is then giving rise to the sense of a self who's appropriating. Now, the chairs behind you, what I've often also mentioned is in terms of dependent origination, why would I think that those are two chairs back there behind you? Why would I think there are chairs? Because I could sit down in them because I have a behind. I often like to point out that if human anatomy was different, like we bent differently, chairs would be shaped differently. <laughs> so what I'm getting at though, is, is that me thinking those are chairs is giving rise to the idea that I'm a creature with a behind that sits down in chairs. So there's a co-arising of that and not not suchness is thinking there's just two chairs back there and i michael am looking at two chairs back there suchness is understanding why they appear to be chairs and it's because i think i'm a creature with a behind that sits a certain way and all of that is such, it is so, be, that's why I think there's chairs there. Now, if I'm in that mode again of knowing, oh, there's not chairs out there. I just think there's chairs because I think I have a behind. If I'm in that mode of thinking, is there craving and desiring those chairs? I just said, I realized there are no chairs. So how could I be clinging or grasping to chairs when I have just realized there are no chairs in that way? Same way with getting angry about these things and so on. So I just, again, I wanted to point at how suchness is always, suchness always engulfs the experiencer, like engulfs them as part of the suchness. And it's not somebody who's observing things as such. That would be probably, again, not a dharmically correct way to think about that. So, okay. Everybody feeling, feeling suchy? Yeah? <laughs> All right, so let's get into the, the text. We have actually some, a bunch of more interesting ideas. So I'm going to be bouncing back and forth between the English translation from the Tibetan that we find on 84,000.read and, of course, my own translation from the Chinese. And Noam's putting those in the chat if you want to check those out. So 
I think this section, so this is, again, this is the section on the Eka Lakshana, the single characteristic. And I think if I remember, I counted, I think there's about 14 bodhisattvas who give their explanation of the teaching. We have, I think, three left. Actually, I think only two left. So we only have two bodhisattvas, I think, left. Um, and so we're getting down to the end of it. And let's see. Well, let's just dive in. So if you're looking at the 84,000.read Tibetan version, I am at line number 1.295. So this is the 295th paragraph of the sutra. And we're dealing with Bodhisattva Trimandala Visuddhi, the three pure mandalas. Three, the three pure mandalas Bodhisattva. So let's see. Bef yeah, before we actually even read this, I want to talk about the bodhisattva's name and then even talk a little bit about what the bodhisattva is about to talk about. So this name's really interesting. And, you know, a mandala, of course, the word mandala means a circle, but you probably know sort of um, kind of these kinds of mandalas, right? It's kind of circle painting drawings. So the word mandala, a circle, you know, it gets used a number of different ways in the Buddhist tradition. They, you know, like I said, they refer to paintings and drawings, but they would also refer to, excuse me, they often refer to the, um, the Bodhi tree, the, what, the site of enlightenment, like where the Buddha was enlightened under the tree, that's called the Bodhi Mandala, the circle of awakening, the Bodhi Mandala. And then also you get a mandala can be a, oh, I, I had never thought about that. I was gonna say a mandala could be a, um, uh, a community. And it's interesting because we talk about a social circle in English. We use that phrase social circle, and that's exactly what a, a way of using the word mandala is as a kind of a congregation or a, a sangha or a group like that. So this bodhisattva is the, the three pure vishuddhi mandalas. And as I've been pointing out, as we've been going through this sutra, the Bodhisattva's name corresponds to the Bodhisattva's teaching. So let me read to you the teaching. So I'm just, I'll read the Tibetan one with a few changes. So if you're reading along, you'll notice I change a few words to match the language I've been using. So the Bodhisattva Trimandala Vishuddhi added, the Dharma teaching on the single characteristic reveals how to avoid contradicting the three spheres when one is teaching the Dharma. What are the three spheres by which I believe they're referring to mandalas? So what are the three circles or spheres or mandalas? not apprehending oneself, not apprehending the Dharma listener, and not fixating on the Dharma. This is called a Dharma teaching in which the three spheres are pure. Okay, uh, I will share with you, I'll read a little bit from uh, my translation, which might clarify a few things, but I wanna kind of first I want to kind of mention, so yeah, we have plenty of time. This is a little 
co little complicated, a little technical, but I think you'll find it interesting. So on, I think it wasn't even last week. I think it was two Sundays ago. When I was reading from the Chinese version, I noted that the Chinese version, some of the bodhisattvas, they started talking about, and, and this gets really complicated because it's, it's all in how this is worded. So the bodhisattva Manjushri at the beginning asks all these bodhisattvas, how do you explain the Dharma door of the single characteristic? And then some of the bodhisattvas in the Chinese version started talking about how the Dharma door, the single characteristic Dharma door is explained as explaining the Dharma without like certain things going on. And what I noted, if you remember, if you were here from a couple of weeks ago, I noted that the Tibetan version doesn't, uh, at least the English translators, because I don't read uh, Tibetan, <clears throat> so I'm relying on their translation. And their translation of those earlier bodhisattvas don't mention the idea of teaching other people about this single characteristic. The first time it mentions it is with this three mandala, three pure mandala bodhisattva. The thing about it is though, is that in reading the Chinese version, there's actually a kind of a little, um, like a little tangential discourse going on, which is about how one successfully or upayakly or skillfully explains this Dharma teaching to others. So I just wanted to note that it, actually in the Chinese, it's much more interesting the way that this builds up. Whereas in the Tibetan, it's only at this moment that we hear this. Now, the, the Tibetan version is very direct about what this means. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna paraphrase it for you in case you didn't catch it. But what does, or how is the Dharma, the single characteristic Dharma door explained? Well, it's explained by avoiding contradicting the, these three spheres. What are the three spheres? They are basically the teacher, the student, and the lesson. The Dharma teacher, the Dharma student, and the Dharma teaching itself. And what the Bodhisattva has told us is that the Dharma teaching on the single characteristic avoids contradicting those three because there is no apprehension of oneself. There is no apprehension of someone listening to the Dharma, and there's no apprehension of any Dharma being taught. That's having all three circles pure or not contradicting. Now, in this, it's about the Dharma teaching, the teacher, student, and, and lesson in that sense. But you often, regarding the Bodhisattva path, you often hear this in terms of gift, giver, and recipient. And of course, the Dharma is a gift. We, that's the very idea is it's not really teaching in that sense. It's a, it's a gift to share the Dharma in that way. But my point is, is that this idea of no subject, no object, no recipient, that's what the Bodhisattva is talking about in terms of this single characteristic Dharma door. And that's where I wanna remind you the single characteristic, this teaching that the bodhisattvas have been going on about, I mentioned that although it has its own unique flavor, the, the single characteristic, you can kind of think of it as a type of non-duality. 
You can kind of think of it that way. And so in terms of duality and non-duality, what would it mean to <laughs> teach the Dharma non-dualistically? Well, that idea would be that there's no teacher, no student and nothing exchanged because otherwise that's three things. There's self, other, and some other third object in that way. That's not non-duality. That's not a single characteristic. So the idea is, is that we need to somehow get to singularity, get to, by which I mean non-duality. And the way that that's done is by not apprehending. And this language of apprehension, they just mean you can't find it. You, you're not finding a self here, not finding a self there, and not finding anything exchanged in that way. Let me read you my translation from the Chinese. It's a little different. So the um, pure triple mandala bodhisattva, trimandala tri visuddhi, said, if when explaining the Dharma, the three wheels are pure, which is that a self cannot be attained in sentient beings, and that there is no differentiation between self and teacher in regard to the Dharma being explained. And therefore, there is no Dharma to grasp or to grasp onto. This is called explaining the single characteristic Dharma door. So, the reason why I wanted to remind you that in the Chinese version, they started introducing, let me kind of see if I can find it. So for example, earlier on, there was a bodhisattva named Sagara, the Anaga king. And Sagara said in the Chinese version, if one is able to enter the extremely profound dharma, which is difficult to enter, like the ocean, and doesn't differentiate this dharma, and explains it to others, yet without speech or concepts, that's called the single characteristic dharma door. So that was one of the first introductions where they introduced this idea of explaining this teaching to others, but in this case, it's not using any speech or any concepts, right? Interesting. And then we go down a few more and there's more references to how to appropriately explain this to others. And my point is that, that this kind of culminates or actually it culminates in the next one, but it's building up to this one where, and now we get rid of the very ideas of there being a self, being an other, and being any kind of exchange in that way. So any questions about the three mandalas, how to purify them, what it would mean to purify them, or what it would even mean to accomplish this? Everybody feeling okay about this teaching? Yeah, you know, I mean, as somebody who's up here currently presently teaching this, I got to tell you, this is a very um, subtle, you know, teaching in that way, by which I mean, it's like layers upon layers going on here. So, and it only gets crazier when we get to the last bodhisattva. So <clears throat> um, let's see. I'll, I'll start with the Tibetan like I've been doing. So the last bodhisattva who in the Tibetan, they, they call him the bodhisattva 
engaged in the profound. Oh no, actually there, there's two more bodhisattvas. I apologize. I missed a bodhisattva. He just has a very, very small section. So backing up, the bodhisattva progression or just progress. The bodhisattva progression added the Dharma teaching on the single characteristic correctly expresses the understanding that all phenomena are conditioned or compounded or are uncompounded. Apologies, are uncompounded, unconditioned. However, to say this means not uttering even a single word since all phenomena are indescribable. Okay, from the Chinese, um, progressing practice or developing practice bodhisattva is how it reads in the Chinese. That bodhisattva said, if one is able to explain the knowledge of true suchness that is without writing or explanation, through the practice of the cultivation of equanimity toward all phenomena, since all phenomena are beyond words and speech, this is called explaining the single characteristic Dharma door. Okay. So this one is interesting because in the Tibetan version, what are we explaining? Like, what's, what's all, what's the crux of this? What's going on? Well, the main part of this is that it's about correctly understanding or correctly expressing the knowledge that all phenomena are unconditioned, that all phenomena are uncompounded. Whereas in the Chinese, it was about the ability to explain the knowledge of true suchness, which is beyond writing and all of that. So there's a little bit of a divergence, whereas the Chinese is actually referring to this idea of thusness or suchness, which is kind of what prompted me to talk about that idea in the beginning. Whereas the Tibetans are interested in asamskrita, and that's an idea I talked about a couple nights ago. So, you know, to put it simply, of course, when we're talking about the understanding that all phenomena is uncompounded, it has to do with that teaching of emptiness that I spoke so much about earlier. And what I mean is, is if I can appeal to that earlier discussion, Normally, we would say that the clock is compounded, is constructed out of all the parts, the batteries, the this, the that, the electronics. And in normal Buddhism, by which I mean original old school Buddhism, all phenomena are composite, are com compounded. When this says that it's, what is the single characteristic Dharma door? Well, it's about expressing this understanding that all phenomena is uncompounded. And the reason why the Chinese would say, oh yeah, it's about expressing true suchness is because when we understand what a clock actually is, and by that I mean, a concept or an idea that's relative to the sun and relative to time and relative to all those things, when we understand that that's what a clock is, meaning it's an idea or a concept, that is not a compounded physical object. That is an idea in that sense. And like I was saying about the chairs, that they be such, that they be so, meaning that I see them as chairs because I see myself as somebody with a behind, 
right? The idea of seeing all of that, again, it's beyond seeing objects and things that are made of atoms and particles or made of whatever. It's about understanding things at a, at a dharmic level, which is to say at a conceptual level. Now, had I been able to do that, right? But without relying on words and speech, that's what they were just talking about. Because me relying on words and speech to demonstrate or point that out, that's not singularity. That's not non-duality. So I didn't do it. I didn't get to that enlightened level of the bodhisattva because I was still relying on words and speech in that way. So that would have been something though, <laughs> had I been able to just be beam you the knowledge in that sense, but that probably still would have been somebody beaming something to somebody else, of course. So, all right, everybody doing okay with that bodhisattva? Cool, then we can finish this out. So our, our last bodhisattva now, this is the bodhisattva engaged in the profound. So the bodhisattva engaged in the profound added the Dharma teaching on the single characteristic teaches how to understand the profundity of all phenomena while not seeing any phenomena. It teaches us how no teacher, no student or teaching can be found. From the Chinese, profound practice or practicing the profound bodhisattva said, if one is able to explain the comprehension of the extremely profound dharma and also not see an explainer, the explanation or anyone being explained to, this is called explaining the single characteristic dharma door. All right, so that finishes out this whole section on the, on the single characteristic dharma door. I kind of have been setting us up to reach this point. So hopefully that last part made a lot of sense where it said that the teaching of the single characteristic understands the profundity of all phenomena while not seeing any phenomena. So, you know, again, we are at the, kind of the end of the road, as it were, at least as far as this poem goes. And so, like, well, like a lot of these Dharma doors, like the one I mentioned in the Vimalakirti that's very close to this, which is the Dharma door of non-duality, these teachings are meant to sort of, you know, they are meant to lead one towards awakening. And so what I mean by that is, is that they are laid out in a kind of, a, in a progression, so that the last one is this final thing where it's sort of this, the, the kind of the ultimate way of putting all of this, right? Which is about ex, ex, understanding this extremely profound dharma or the, you know, the extreme profundity of all phenomena without seeing any phenomena, right? And then of course, this kind of refrain of, and also not seeing any explainer, anybody being explained to, or anything being explained. So, any questions, comments, answers, ideas about the inexistence of things in that regard? Emptiness, suchness. Everybody feeling okay about all of this? Cool. Let me just finish out this section then. So this, the, the, I'm reading from the sutra now. This continued until all the splendorous bodhisattvas, those great beings, had demonstrated their eloquence. When this Dharma door 
of the teaching on the single characteristic was presented, 700 million bodhisattvas gained the patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all phenomena, 84 trillion beings developed a mind set upon Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, the minds of 7,000 monks were liberated from defilements without any further grasping, and 9 billion 600 million gods and humans purified their dharma eyes, which sees phenomena free from the dust. <laughs> All right. So just a quick recap about that last part. Um, I've kind of actually been mentioning these, but I kind of want to mention them all together. So if you've been following along now for a long time, many months we've been studying this sutra, but if you've been coming to Dharma doors, you've heard those things before about bodhisattvas generating bodhicitta or the supreme you know, will for enlightenment, uh, developing the patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all phenomena, and so this is one where we kind of have all of the different levels, so to speak. So the idea is, is that the highest level, the highest level insight here is this patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all phenomena. And because this has kind of been, you know, I feel like this has been a good Dharma talk on some basic ideas you know, I want to remind you that that, what is the patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all things? Well, if you have followed along and you understand the emptiness of the clock, if you understand that a clock is an idea and a concept, and that this collection of stuff in that way, while it could be thought of as a clock, there is no clock to be found here. If you really, really understand that, then you understand that this clock, it didn't come into existence in, uh, I think this one was made in China. Yep, made in China. So if you think that this is like a clock, then you would think that it had a birthday meaning a manufactured date, a day that it came into existence, and it is currently existing. But the idea is, is that if something comes into existence and it is existing, it'll fall apart and it'll eventually go out of existence. So there's the birth of the clock, by which we mean the manufacturer, and there is the death of the clock, by which we mean its decomposition. But if you understand what a clock really is, meaning an idea or a concept, that is not created or destroyed. It is birthless. And if you understand that everything we've been talking about isn't just about clocks, but it goes for everything, then you can understand the birthlessness of everything. This isn't a pencil. It's a long, narrow thing that I could put in my hand, and therefore I think it's a pencil. So it wasn't created and won't be destroyed. But when I think it's a pencil, it be a pencil. It be so. It be such, meaning the whole thing. But that isn't created or destroyed. It just is or isn't in that sense. Once again, though, I really want to remind you, this is, this is not about clocks and pencils. It's about this Dharma. It's about the one that I call Michael that I think is just the one entity. 
And I could be lured, I could be lured into thinking that that entity was born many, 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 many years ago. And you know what I then get? If I think that that entity called Michael was born many, many years ago and is currently existing, you know what you get when you think that way? You get that by necessity that there's the expiration date. It's how, it's how it goes. That which is born must die in that way. But if I just told you that there is no Michael in that sense, well, that then is like a clock or a pencil in that way where it is birthless. And you know what the great thing about being birthless is? Being deathless. And it's why they call, or at least in the old school, they used to call the Dharma, they used to call the teachings of the Buddha, the teachings of the deathless. And remember, that's why Siddhartha left it all behind. Siddhartha left the throne and left the palace and all of that to find a way out of getting old and dying. Now, originally, he seemed to be looking for a kind of path to immortality. Like maybe I could do some kind of yoga or some kind of pranayama, and that way I could avoid getting old and dying. But what the Buddha realized was that the very thing that I'm worried about dying doesn't exist to begin with. And that realization then is called that teaching of the deathless. So that's what the bodhisattvas get when they realize the patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all phenomena. And then there are the kind of lesser insights or the lesser realizations here, right? One is about generating just bodhicitta. So that's actually like, hey, I want to realize the birthlessness of all phenomena too. <laughs> I want to attain the, the patient tolerance. So that's generating bodhicitta, right? And again, that was the next one down on the list because that's generating the mind of a bodhisattva that will get you to the patient tolerance. The one be below that was about 7,000 monks being liberated from their defilements. And that, of course, is kind of, well, it's not like a jab at the old school, but it's kind of like, it definitely puts it below generating bodhicitta in that idea. And then the very kind of the, the kind of the most basic insight that we could have garnered from this Dharma talk is this purification of our Dharma eyes. So, and that's, uh, I did a talk a couple of Sundays ago about the dust, about the rajas, all of the dust settling on the sensory organs. And so this idea of 9 billion, 600 million gods and humans all purifying their dharma eyes of the dust. Now, Puring, purifying one's dharma eye of the dust doesn't exactly constitute realizing emptiness or the patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all things. Basically freeing our minds up of all the dust and clarifying our dharma eyes, as I mentioned last week, is, ha, has mainly to do about, with the, um, the wanting or the aversion, the craving, or the anger and all of that. And so to kind of settle down and be like, you know, couch, chair, pencil, clock, it's all just kind of stuff to then kind of settle into a kind of equanimity regarding things, which is to say a kind of sameness to everything, a kind of equality to everything, nothing being better or worse, just different, 
but not better or worse. That's purifying one's Dharma eye. But what I want you to notice is that in the purification of one's Dharma eye, there's still the stuff and it still kind of exists like as stuff. It's just all equal in that way. And that of course is kind of a important starting point for achieving those other insights. That's it for me. Any last questions, comments, answers, ideas? All right. Ta-ta-ta. -ta -ta. <laughs>